The views and opinions expressed in this program are not necessarily those of Union Broadcasting, Inc., ESPN 1510, or its employees. The host is solely responsible for the on-air content. The views expressed in this program are for informational purposes only and do not constitute investment advice. Investing in ETFs involves risk, including the potential loss of principal. Any past performance figures discussed are not necessarily indicative of future results. Visit ETFstore.com for more information. Now it's time for the ETF Store Show. The investment pros at the ETF Store discuss everything you need to know about exchange-traded funds and the world of investing. Whether you're an investing expert or just starting out, Nate and Connor will help you get up to date on what's happening on Wall Street and show you how exchange-traded funds can help lower your investment costs, reduce your tax bill, and allow you to take advantage of investment opportunities around the world. And now, the host of the ETF Store Show, Nate Geraci. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the ETF Store Show. Nate Geraci, along with Connor Kelly in studio this morning. Thanks for tuning in. And as always, if you have questions on anything that we discuss on today's show, or if you would like more information about investing in ETFs, you can call an ETF Store Investment Advisor today at 877-365-ETFs. That's 877-365-3837. Or you can visit us online at ETFstore.com. Okay, so we still get quite a few questions on what some of the major differences are between mutual funds and ETFs. And I thought this might make for a good topic this morning, because while mutual funds and ETFs do share many similarities, there are some key differences between the two that could impact you as an investor. And I thought what we might do is sort of break this into two parts. We'll talk first about differences that we know to be fact, really black and white differences that get at how mutual funds and ETFs operate. We'll then cover some points of differentiation that I guess you could say are a little more debatable, but these are still areas where we think you should know what the averages say and just be aware of as you decide whether to use a mutual fund or an ETF. So that'll be the first part of the show. And then later, we'll be joined by Christian Magoon, founder of Yield Shares and CEO of Magoon Capital. He's a wonderful all-around resource on ETFs, so we'll get his thoughts on the continued growth of ETFs and dig into two ETFs that he's heavily involved with including one that just launched last week uh, with quite a bit of fanfare. We'll also have our usual weekly market update and ETF spotlight. And as always, if you'd like to send us questions or comments, you can find us on Twitter or email us at advice at ETFstore.com. So as I mentioned, we do continue to receive quite a few questions regarding differences between mutual funds and ETFs. And so we thought it might be helpful to highlight some of these differences and provide a little bit of color around why each of these might be important. And let me first say, there are a lot of similarities between mutual funds and ETFs, maybe more so than what some investors may realize. If you think about it, they're both ways to access a basket of securities, whether stocks or bonds or other investments. Both mutual funds and ETFs hold multiple securities. And because of that, both can offer diversification in the sense that they do hold multiple securities as opposed to just one. Now, interestingly, Most ETFs are formed under the exact same investment laws as mutual funds. Uh, Most are what are called open-ended funds, and they're registered under the Investment Company Act of 1940. Uh, As a matter of fact, according to Vanguard, 90% of ETF assets are held in ETFs registered under the Investment Company Act of 1940. So as much as we talk about the differences between ETFs and mutual funds, There are some real similarities here, and I think especially so if you're comparing ETFs and index mutual funds, and we'll touch on that a little more in a moment. But of course, there are some differences between the two as well, and so that's what we're going to spend a few minutes focusing on this morning. Nate, let me jump in real quick and and set the stage before we dig in here. There are a lot of nuances to both mutual funds and ETFs, and we're going to dig in, but let me provide a view from 10,000 feet of both. Simply put, a mutual fund is a pool of money provided by different individual investors. That pool of funds is then managed by a person or team that are buying individual stocks, bonds, whatever that particular fund invests in. In the case of index funds, they simply track an index. The investors equally share in the gains or losses of those underlying holdings. Okay, pretty simple. Most ETFs are just like index-based mutual funds in that they track an index, 
but they trade during the day like a stock. Thus the name exchange traded funds because when you trade, you trade on an exchange like the New York Stock Exchange. So investors can buy or sell positions throughout the day just like they can with shares of any other stock, Apple, Google, Google, Ford, etc. Well, that's a good description. And, you know, I thought what we'd do is start with some hard facts in terms of the differences between mutual funds and ETFs. Uh, and, of course, first, as you just mentioned, Connor, we do know that ETFs trade intraday on an exchange. Uh, if you want to buy or sell shares of an ETF at 10 a.m. during the week, you can do that just like you could with 100 shares of Apple stock or 100 shares of Microsoft. Uh, and with mutual funds, you can only buy or sell shares at the end of the day. And as you pointed out, Connor, of course, it's this ability of ETFs to trade during the day. That's why they are called exchange-traded funds. Yeah, and, and two things, Nate. Just because you can trade during the day doesn't mean you have to or that you should, okay? And, and, and we take a very um, long-term approach towards asset allocation and, and managing money for our clients. We're not day traders or market timers, but... It is nice and important to have that flexibility when urgent situations arise. Now, some investors think just because they can hop online to their American Funds account or their brokerage account and and enter a trade during the day to trade, buy or sell a mutual fund, that mutual funds trade during the day. That is not correct. Regardless if you put in that order at 8.30 a.m. when the market clo- opens or right before the closing bell, you will get the same price at the end of the day called NAV or net asset value. Everybody who buys or sells the mutual fund during the day ends up getting that same NAV price at day end. Yeah, so the bottom line is ETFs trade on an exchange during the day. Mutual funds don't. Now, another difference between the two is we know that ETFs, by law, must disclose their holdings every single day. Mutual funds are only required to disclose their holdings on a quarterly basis, Uh, and even then it can be up to 60 days in arrears. Uh, Now, look, you can decide for yourself whether this matters to you as an investor, but clearly this is a difference. It is, and and maybe as an investor you aren't concerned with knowing what your individual mutual funds own. We take a different view. I mean, when we manage all of the money for all of our clients, it is vital for us to know exactly what our ETFs own every single day. A quick side story here, Nate. This happened just recently, and I had a discussion with a prospective client, and he was currently using all mutual funds actively managed um, to manage his money. And he's a young, aggressive investor. And after digging into his current fund lineup, Um, we found out that he had over 7% allocated to cash. And he had no idea. And as an aggressive aggressive investor, he wasn't necessarily happy to find out this fact. Um, But that's simply due to the lack of transparency in mutual funds and the active management that he thought he was, you know, 100% into the market and found that he had over a 7% cash buffer because of the um, lack of transparency in his mutual fund holdings. And again, we're going through some of the key differences between mutual funds and ETFs. And and as we've already discussed, we know ETFs trade on an exchange during the day, and they must disclose their holdings every day. Trades for mutual funds are processed once at the end of the day, and they must disclose their holdings quarterly. Now, another difference between the two has to do with taxes. Uh, And let me explain this with a basic example Let's say uh, Connor and I both own shares of the same mutual fund, uh, and Connor needs some money to buy a house. So he sells some of his mutual fund shares. In order to give Connor his cash, the mutual fund may need to sell shares of stocks held by the fund to raise the cash necessary to give to Connor. And if the fund sells those stocks at a gain, they're required by law to distribute those gains to all mutual fund shareholders, including me. And those are taxable in a taxable account. So to recap... In this case, because Connor needs cash to buy a house, I would actually get hit with a taxable capital gain distribution. With an ETF, if Connor needs cash, he would simply sell his shares on an exchange with no impact to me. Yeah, I mean, simply put, Nate, the bottom line is with with mutual funds, the actions of other shareholders can impact your tax situation. And The redemption process you just described, Nate, is one piece of the tax advantage behind ETFs. 
The other side of it is the behind-the-scenes creation and redemption process of, of ETF shares. And without mudding the waters too much, what you need to understand is this. ETFs have the ability to get rid of their lowest cost basis stock during this creation and redemption process, minimizing this tax burden on the owner of the ETF. Mutual funds do not have this luxury. That's a big difference. And another impact um, on the tax liabilities of a mutual fund is if it's actively managed, which obviously most are. There's much higher turnover or trading in most actively managed mutual funds compared to an index fund or an ETF. And the result is very often realized capital gains that you just mentioned by law have to be passed on to shareholders of that fund. One final side note before we move to the next topic. Because investors in mutual funds are constantly buying and redeeming shares, the mutual funds have to keep a buffer of cash on hand to quickly pay out for share That's redemptions. Good point. This is what's known in the industry as cash drag. And over the long term, it can certainly be a negative impact towards performance. ETFs don't have this problem because you sell your shares on the exchange. You don't redeem your shares from the company directly like you do with a mutual fund. So another big um, but subtle difference that maybe most investors aren't aware of in, in the mutual fund space. And to be clear, we're not saying every ETF is more tax efficient than every mutual fund. But what we are saying is that the structure of ETFs is more favorable. That's the part that's a fact. Uh, even with index mutual funds, Morningstar did a study that showed for large cap blend funds, ETFs were still more tax efficient. It's the structure of the two. The fact that ETFs trade on an exchange and that redemptions are handled in kind, as you just described, Connor. Uh, okay, a few other quick differences between ETFs and mutual funds. Uh, ETFs don't have any minimum purchase requirements. And you can buy ETFs through any brokerage. With mutual funds, they can have minimum dollar purchase requirements, and you may only be able to buy certain funds directly from the mutual fund company. Nate, you can literally buy one share of an ETF if you want. There are no minimums on any ETFs out there. And a lot of popular mutual funds have minimums that are somewhat significant. There was a recent study by BYU that found that over half, 51%, of all mutual funds required a minimum purchase between a thousand and twenty five hundred dollars. Another fourth or twenty seven percent wanted more than twenty five hundred dollars to get into their funds. So over seventy five percent of mutual funds required a minimum purchase of at least a thousand dollars. To your other point, Nate, with an ETF, you can buy ETF shares on any platform where you can buy shares of stock. And there are some mutual funds that you can certainly buy in any brokerage account, just like ETFs, but there are many other mutual fund companies that only allow their funds to be purchased in an account held directly with their firm. All right, and one last thing in terms of hard differences between mutual funds and ETFs that we know uh, is that we know that ETFs don't have any sales loads or 12B1 fees, essentially distribution fees and incentives for brokers to sell the funds. Uh, and we also know that mutual funds have higher embedded record-keeping costs. Yeah, so... Let me kind of run through these one by one. If a broker is selling you a mutual fund, there can be an upfront commission paid to the broker. That can be as high as 6%. ETFs never pay commissions or loads to their advisors that might recommend them. The 12B1 fee or a trail, think of this as, as what a 12B1 fee is. It's essentially a fee the mutual fund charges you to then go pay for the marketing of that fund back to you as a potential investor. That sounds like a pretty bad deal. Uh, and then, to your point, the administrative costs to mutual fund companies due to their redemption process is substantial. Anytime a person buys or sells a mutual fund, that mutual fund company is responsible for the record-keeping of that trade. That is not the case with ETFs because they are all traded on the exchange like shares of stock. Just like there's no cost to Apple or GE or Garmin for investors to buy or sell their stock, there isn't a cost to the ETF providers when investors trade ETFs. 
Okay, so all of these differences we just walked through, uh, we would consider these to be hard truths. Uh, these are differences between mutual funds and ETFs, I think plain and simple. Now, what about some of the other differences you might hear? Uh, things like ETFs have lower cost uh, or they're index-based. These are going to depend upon the funds that you're looking at because you can certainly find mutual funds that are less expensive than ETFs, and there are ETFs that are actively managed. Uh, but here's what we can say on the whole. On average, ETFs are less expensive than mutual funds. Uh, really, by any measure you look at, simple average, weighted average, uh, whatever, on the whole, ETFs cost less than mutual funds. Yeah, Nate, and that's an important factor. And again, there are more and more actively managed ETFs coming out, but generally speaking, actively managed mutual funds to index-based ETFs, the cost savings can be substantial. And then one last difference I would mention uh, is, again, that the majority of ETFs are index-based, whereas the majority of mutual funds are actively managed. Uh, again, not every ETF is index-based, and not every mutual fund is actively managed, but on the whole, ETFs tend to be passive and mutual funds tend to be active. Well, Nate, one other thing that we hear, and it's kind of the last ditch um, effort with mutual funds to say ETFs cost something, and that you hear this complaint that ETFs have a trading commission while mutual funds don't. That all depends on where your accounts happen to be. If it's Fidelity, Schwab, E-Trade, TD Ameritrade, all of those platforms offer a substantial amount of ETFs and mutual funds that trade for free on their particular platform. What is not a hard truth is that mutual funds don't have commissions. Okay, there's there's often times that the cost of trading an ETF can be significantly less than trading a mutual fund if that mutual fund doesn't happen to be on that custodian's preferred list, free trade list, call it what you may. The bottom line is this. Dig in to what applies to your particular situation. Where are your accounts held? You know, what is your platform? Then look at the trading commissions and the free trade list of, of mutual funds and ETFs on that platform because they are different with every different custodian out there. Yeah, and on this this last note uh, that I was talking about in terms of passes, uh, passive versus active management, you know, really... The issue there, and I don't want to beat this into the ground, is that if you look at the data out there, we know that the majority of active managers tend to underperform their benchmark index. Exactly right. And our regular listeners know the, the name Spiva Scorecard. We talk about it twice a year when the updated performance figures come out. But regardless of the time horizon or the asset class, you can talk government bonds or small cap U.S. stocks or emerging markets the average over any time period is roughly 80% of actively managed mutual funds underperform their benchmark. All right, we do need to head to break here. Uh, and as we said earlier, I think it's important to point out there are a lot of similarities between mutual funds and ETFs, but we did think it was important to point out where some of the differences lie. And look, we are the ETF store. We obviously believe ETFs are a better way to invest. But here's how uh, I always explain this. For me, it simply comes down to having better control over investment outcomes. And here's what I mean by that. If I can control when I buy or sell shares, and again, remember, you can buy or sell shares of an ETF during the day. You can't with mutual funds. Now, again, you don't have to buy or sell shares during the day, but you have the option to. If I can have more control over when I get a tax bill, because again, remember with mutual funds, other shareholders uh, or things like mutual fund manager turnover can cause you to get a tax bill. If I can see what I own every single day, with ETFs I can, with mutual funds I can't. And then on the whole, if I can better control my cost, uh, as we just talked about, we know that on average ETFs are less expensive, and I can control my active manager risk. Again, we know the majority of active mutual funds underperform their benchmarks. These are all important things to me. Uh, and simply put, it's why we prefer using ETFs in our portfolios. Okay, let's take a break here, and when we come back, We'll be joined by a tremendous resource on ETFs, Christian Magoon, founder of ETF provider Yield Shares and CEO of Magoon Capital. He's consulted on the launch of more than 50 ETFs, including a new cybersecurity ETF, which launched last week. He'll join us right after the break. This is the ETF Store Show on ESPN 1510.
When refinancing a mortgage, all of the numbers can become confusing. With First Mortgage Solutions, you only need to remember two, 500, and zero. $500 is the amount our average customer saves every month after refinancing. And zero is the number of loans we've ever done that have ended up in default. At First Mortgage Solutions, business is based on dollars and cents. Saving you dollars with loans that make sense. For more information, call 816-778-7000 or apply online at firstmortgagekc.com. NMLS number 244476. There's never a bad time to see your dentist. So if you haven't been for a while or if one of your teeth is actually starting to hurt, it's always easier to fix it before it gets worse. We aren't anti-dentites like the Seinfeld episode. So give Dr. Kevin or Matt Cummings a call at 816-246-1003 or check us out on our website, www.cummingsdentistry.com. Remember, floss the ones you want to keep and mention this ad and get a 10% discount on your first visit. There's a revolution occurring in the investment world. Exchange-traded funds, which have been called the next-generation mutual funds, can help lower your investment costs, reduce your tax bill, and increase your investment options. This is Nate Geraci with the ETF Store, an investment advisor located right here in Kansas City. Call us toll-free at 877-365-3837 or visit us online at etfstore.com. And don't forget to tune in to the ETF Store Show every Tuesday at 9 a.m. right here on ESPN 1510. Want a more beautiful, livable home? Talk to Schlegel Design Remodel. No one offers more ways to add value to your home while saving you money. I'm Jake Schlegel. We have services for every need, like our popular one-week bath and express custom kitchen remodels, completed in a lot less time for a lot less money. We also offer professional handyman services for chores around your home. Whatever your needs, call Schlegel Design Remodel, 816-361-9669, or go to remodelagain.com today. For those of you who haven't heard, the oldest building in Kansas City has the newest rooftop deck. Kelly's Westport Inn's rooftop deck has a full-service bar, TVs, bathrooms, lots of fans, and an awesome view of Westport. Kelly's has a weekday happy hour Monday through Friday from 3 to 7. They also have live music every Friday and Saturday night. Come enjoy tunes from bands like Lost Wax, Flanagan's Right Hook, and Michael Beer's Band. Every city has a place where the elite gather for witty conversation over trendy cocktails. In Kansas City, that place is definitely not Kelly's. For more information, go to kellyswestportin.com. Welcome back to the ETF Store Show. Nate Geraci along with Connor Kelly in studio this morning. We have a tremendous guest for you this morning, really an ETF insider and someone who I think uh, without question is a pioneer and thought leader in the, in, in the uh, industry, Christian Magoon, founder of Yield Cheers and CEO of Magoon Capital. Christian has been involved in the launch of over 50 exchange-traded products. He's been featured and quoted in a whole slew of media outlets, CNBC, Fox Business, The Wall Street Journal, so on and so forth. And we now have Christian joining us via phone from just outside Chicago. Christian, as always, just a pleasure to have you with us today. Nate, thanks. It's great to join you again, and uh, great to be back on the ETF Store Show. Well, Christian, a lot I want to get to this morning, including two ETFs that you're heavily involved with. But first, we are winding down 2014. It's certainly been a great year for ETFs. We're on track for another record year of inflows. I was hoping maybe you could give us sort of your ETF state of the union. Uh, high level, where are we, are, where are we with uh, ETFs? Yeah, it, it's been a very uh, interesting year, as usual, for ETFs. It's a, an emerging uh, industry that's over 20 years old now, and it's really growing. Uh, really, the four trends I'm kind of keeping an eye on are first just asset growth, um, ETFs have about $1.9 trillion in assets so far this year, up from about $1.7 trillion at the end of uh, last year, so about 13% growth in assets. Um, that's a, a very positive sign. It, it, what's interesting to see is actually compare that $1.9 trillion to other industries. Uh, hedge funds, for example, have a $3 trillion in assets. So ETFs are quickly um, uh, approaching what hedge fund assets are worldwide. Uh, still uh, smaller than uh, mutual funds at uh, 15 trillion in assets, but um, go, uh, rapidly gaining ground. Um, there's been about 150 billion dollars of uh, assets that have flowed into ETFs this year. The record was set in 2013 with uh, 188 billion. Uh, the last few months of the year tend to be very strong for ETF flows historically, so looks like we could have a record year, maybe even get to that 200 billion dollar inflow mark. 
Uh, besides the growth, we're seeing a lot of new players in the space, uh, a lot of uh, registered investment advisors launching their own ETFs and moving assets there. We're also seeing large asset managers, um, some mer- merger and acquisition activity with firms like Goldman Sachs, uh, uh, Janus, uh, Velocity Shares. Um, also seeing fixed income um, start to really take off in the ETF space. Um, the industry, again, has grown about 13% in assets this year, but fixed income ETFs have grown 20%. So we're seeing a lot more people adopt fixed income ETF solutions. And then looking forward, there's a lot of interesting uh, new products and even some uh, different types of structures on the horizon for uh, 2015. So, uh, again, another exciting year for ETFs and, and investors, uh, really ad- adding a lot more um, choices for investors and um, seeing a lot more efficient access come to different strategies um, and different ways to access ETFs through, for example, uh, no-fee uh, commission ETFs. Well, let's talk about some of the specific ETFs that you're involved with. You founded ETF provider Yield uh, YieldShares about a year and a half ago. You launched the Yield Shares High Income ETF, ticker YYY, and already it has crossed over $80 million uh, in assets. Now, this ETF invests in what are called closed-in funds, and I guess before we talk about exactly what the CTF does, for our listeners who may not be familiar with closed-end funds, can you give us sort of a quick overview? Yeah, closed-end funds are interesting. They're actually the first form of fund that um, launched in the United States back in the 1890s, about 30 years before the first mutual fund. Um, they are a publicly traded uh, investment company that invests in a variety of securities, stocks, bonds. They tend to be actively managed, and they tend to be focused on paying um, a monthly or, or quarterly income. Uh, the closed part of their name refers to the unique kind of characteristic of closed-end funds, uh, closed-end funds raise assets through an IPO, and then once that capital is raised, there's typically no more shares available from the fund sponsor, and new issuance is closed to investors, and that's, again, that why that closed aspect um, is part of the name. The, the, the plus and the minus of that closed uh, structure is that um, f- uh, the investors are buying and selling shares not with the fund, but actually with each other on a stock exchange. And um, because of that, um, there's not really a way to, re, uh, to actually uh, deal with premiums or discounts that develop in the shares. So quite often, uh, at least historically, the average closed-end fund can be bought below NAV at a discount to NAV, which is unique if you come from the mutual fund or ETF world, usually buying at NAV plus a few cents or maybe plus a sales charge. Closed-end funds are a little bit different when they're in the secondary market. Again, they try to, tend to trade or can be bought below NAV. So what we're doing with our yield shares product is using the efficiency of the ETF to take advantage of the inefficiency of closed-end funds and really try to target some of these closed-end funds that you can purchase below their net asset value. Well, yeah, let's talk a little bit more about the Yield Shares High Income ETF. This does hold a basket of closed-end funds. These cover stocks, bonds, even multi-asset funds, currencies, convertible securities. The CTF is currently yielding around 8.6%. So obviously the primary focus here is on income. But I guess tell us a little bit more about how the ETF works. Right. So it's an index-based uh, ETF. So um, there's a rules-based index that looks at the closed-end fund universe and implies a set investment methodology that really ranks the closed-end funds uh, by three categories. One is their income. Second is their discount to net asset value. And third is their liquidity. And basically, the 30 closed-end funds that rank highest overall in these three factors end up becoming the index, uh, the 30 uh, closed-end fund constituent index. Uh, those closed-end funds are you know, managed by you know, names that most people would recognize, uh, BlackRock, Eaton Vance, Nuveen, PIMCO. Uh, and then the fund actually seeks to track that index, YYY, the ticker of the fund, seeks to track that index and really deliver the returns, basically the income and the capital appreciation or depreciation um, after uh, before fees and expenses um, to the investor. So um, it's a, an efficient way to gain access to closed-end funds, which typically uh, tend to generate um, a significant or meaningful uh, income. Uh, you know, currently from a, a, a distribution standpoint, you know, our, our, we pay on a monthly basis uh, distributions to shareholders, and that, like you said, that SEC 30-day yield is about 8.6 percent. So seen a lot of interest there, and it's you know, kind of a unique ETF in the sense that it's an index approach to active managers. 
Christian, you touched on this a little bit, but why is it that closed-in funds might trade at a discount? And I guess more importantly or along with that, if many of these funds ultimately move back closer to the real value, why don't more investors take advantage of these discounts? Yeah, that's great questions. Uh, I think first, most people aren't aware of closed-end funds. There's only there's a little less than 600 closed-end funds. Um, that's quite a bit smaller than the ETF or the mutual fund universe. This whole uh, phenomena of discounts, uh, I think, is kind of um, off-putting to many investors. They're not used to it, and um, they don't want to get stuck in a fund that maybe trades at a discount um, for a long period of time. Uh, what we're trying to do in the index is take advantage of seasonal discounts in closed-end funds, and that simply means that at the end of um, the year each year, there are certain closed-end funds that don't do well, so maybe asset classes or types of management styles. Those closed-end funds generally get targeted for tax loss selling purposes by income investors. And when there's an uh, accelerated amount of selling in certain closed-end funds or asset classes of closed-end funds, the discounts tend to gap out kind of artificially towards the end of the year. And what we're trying to do is take advantage of that kind of seasonal pattern. To Our index goes in and selects the closed-end funds um, right at the end of the year to try to capture closed-end funds that are trading at a wider-than-average discount. And then it, the index basically holds those funds for a year and um, hopefully can uh, make up some of that uh, discount as it compacts um, and the funds uh, uh, perform uh, more in line with their uh, peer group averages. Christian, can you explain the leverage component of closed-end funds? You know, you look at the the, the current yield of 8.6%. I know a number of these funds are using leverage to essentially magnify their returns. H- how does this work? That's right. One of the unique aspects of closed-end funds is that portfolio managers have the ability in many cases to implement uh, leverage into their, clo- their, their actual mutual fund or closed-end fund management. Um, this usually means that they can leverage the portfolio by about 33% at most in terms of assets. So when you look at the average closed-end fund that YYY holds, the average closed-end fund has a leverage of 11% um, as of uh, uh, last month end. Uh, and w- essentially what uh, that leverage is for is to try to maximize current income in the 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 basic equation is that if a fund manager can go out and borrow assets, say a third of the fund at, funds against a third of the fund's assets for say three or four percent, but invest in uh, bonds or covered call strategies that may yield six or seven percent, um, they can actually take that spread, the difference between what their borrow their borrowing cost and their and the actual income they're receiving from their strategy, and that can be beneficial to shareholders and be additive to their uh, to their income position. So uh, that's where leverage comes into play in the closed-end fund space. And uh, again, it's used um, only based off portfolio manager discretion, so it can change. Um, and it's, again, only done if shareholders can benefit on the difference between borrowing cost and the income coming in from the actual investment strategy. Christian, this is Connor Kelly. On the the yield of YYY at 8.6 obviously gets potential investors' attention. But beyond the leverage, talk about the risk characteristics of what this fund owns. I mean, is, is it heavily weighted towards historically high-yielding sectors like utilities, et cetera, or is this a really well-diversified fund? That's a good question, Connor. Uh, the portfolio is fairly diversified, um, especially from um, an asset class perspective. So believe it or not, the highest yielding aspect of the uh, underlying funds are actually equity funds, which is uh, r- roughly about 60% of the portfolio. Um, closed-end funds that are organized as uh, equity funds generally um, uh, go- are going out and executing covered call strategies on international and domestic stocks. Essentially, that's kind of the most conservative option strategy, basically going out and trying to um, write covered calls against positions you already own, so taking in that premium income. And right. that, Go ahead, Christian. So that's so that's one of the largest sources of, of yield, um, and um, you know what, what's interesting about cover call strategies. They tend to do well in volatile markets because uh, premiums tend to be a little bit larger. But in, just in terms of diversification, um, you know about sixty percent stocks, th- about forty percent bonds. There's some multi-asset exposure there, so it's a lot like a typical balanced portfolio. And again, because the thirty holdings are actually funds. You now get hundreds of individual positions uh, that are held by each of the 30 funds. 
Christian, lastly here, before we move on, where do you see uh, this yield shares ETF perhaps fitting into somebody's invest, investment portfolio? Yeah, where we've um, heard people using it is really in kind of this hybrid income strategy position. Um, so uh, there's you know, uh, there's allocations that people are focusing on that are really blends of bond income and equity income, and um, that is where really this fits. It's kind of a balanced portfolio being that 60-40 roughly allocation between stocks and bonds. Um, it does pay on a monthly basis, so that's attractive to, to many investors. And unlike maybe some of the higher-yielding bond alternatives that have fairly high durations, the overall effective duration of the portfolio is about two years. And that's because, again, of the equity exposure. And you know, duration, again, is just a measure of the sensitivity of a portfolio to a change of interest rates. It's always measured in years. The more years, the more sensitive that portfolio will be um, to a change of interest rates. And being around two years effective duration um, is on the lower end of, of a duration number for um, package products. We're visiting with Christian Magoon, founder of Yield Shares and CEO of Magoon Capital. Christian, I mentioned earlier that you've been involved with a launch of over 50 ETFs. And just last week, you were involved with a launch of another new ETF. This made a pretty big splash. The Pure Funds ISE Cybersecurity ETF. The ticker on that is HACK, HACK, uh, which, by the way, I think that has to go on our list of best ETF tickers. Uh, but this ETF holds the stocks of companies providing cybersecurity solutions. These are companies that might prevent or defend against data breaches and other cyber attacks. Where did this concept come from? Well, really, it began uh, several years ago. The index provider, uh, ISE, has uh, kind of identified in the past areas or sub-industries of the technology space that have had some um, potential for growth. So about three and a half years ago, they created an index of cloud computing companies, and that is actually tracked by the First Trust ISE Cloud Computing ETF, SKYY. Uh, that ETF's been in existence you know, for over three years, as I mentioned, has about $350 million in assets. And when they were looking kind of into that space, it required a lot of fundamental analysis of what companies had kind of the most true exposure to that uh, form of business. And they really started to look at cybersecurity at that same time. Um, it's only been recently, though, that the, um, uh, the universe of companies that had a material focus on cybersecurity has been uh, diverse enough and liquid enough to really launch an investable product. So, uh, yeah, that last week uh, the cybersecurity ETF uh, launched on Wednesday, and you know we've been, been hearing a lot of feedback saying, boy, we're surprised something like this didn't already exist. Um, so it's, uh, it's starting uh, very strongly, and, you know, in just three or four days it's, um, on, on its way over uh, 20, 20 million in assets. So a good start for a, a new ETF. Well, tell us a little bit more about the ETF itself. How are the holdings selected? How are they weighted? What are some of the individual stocks that the ETF holds right now? Right. So it's an index-based ETF, and really uh, it starts with kind of a qualitative uh, process where uh, the analyst team at the index provider actually goes in and looks at a lot of the um, underlying technology companies that have some exposure to uh, cybersecurity, hardware, software, or um, services, meaning, meaning consulting services. And what they do is really exclude companies that have, um, what I would say, not a very material presence in the cybersecurity industry, um, or uh, it's just an ancillary business. And you know, from that process, they've basically created a universe of about 30 companies diversified kind of around the, uh, the, the globe that focus on, again, these areas that primarily uh, fit in this inf the infrastructure space, which is software, hardware, or the services space. And again, consulting services, uh, analyzing data um, on a person-to-person -person basis. Uh, so the, uh, it, the, the ETF hack se seeks to track the index. Uh, the index is quite unique, um, just taking a look at some of the large broad-based technology ETFs like QQQ or the Select Technology Spider ETF XLK. There's less than a 5% portfolio weighting overlap in HACS holdings to these two ETFs. So it's quite additive, I think, in terms of a diversification play for investors. Um, when you look at some of the top holdings, um, you can... Um, see that some, many of these companies aren't household names. Uh, Vasco uh, Data Security, VDSI, happens to be the top fund holding. It's the top index holding as well. 
Um, they're a company that really makes um, uh, uh, software uh, services that monitor access to information and secure networks. Uh, there's another firm, the second largest, holding Imperva Incorporated, IMPV, second largest holding again in the fund and the index. And they really focus on kind of securing networks and information access in certain industries, financial services, uh, e-commerce, retail, as well as working with uh, governments. So very kind of unique portfolio. And, you know, with Cyber Monday around the corner here, uh, it's uh, probably a, a great time to take a look at these companies. Uh, yes, there's a great, I think, a, a compelling long-term growth potential for them, but there's also been some event-driven times where um, – these companies have seen some uh, capital appreciation due to either high-profile attacks, breaches, or even uh, spending um, kind of announcements from governments or large contracts. Well, Christian, we'll have to leave it there this morning. Uh, as always, just a, a very insightful discussion. We really appreciate you joining us today. Thanks. It's a pleasure to be on. Look forward to joining you again. That was Christian Magoon, founder of Yield Shares and CEO of Magoon Capital. And you can learn more about Yield Shares by visiting yieldshares.com. And you can learn more about the cybersecurity ETF we just covered by visiting pureetfs.com. I would also mention that Christian is a, a great follow on Twitter. He was actually selected as one of Wall Street Journal's best tweets for your money. His handle is at Christian Magoon. All right, let's take a break. And when we come back, we'll talk oil prices in our weekly market update. This is the ETF Store Show on ESPN 1510. Will you profit from rising food prices? Bulk Food International. Do you want a tangible asset besides gold or silver? Bulk Food International. Would you like to own an investment that will be valuable 10, 20, 30 years from now? Bulk Food International. With Bulk Food International, you can own a variety of food products that will be viable and valuable for years to come. Bulk Food International will store your products for you or deliver to your location. Best of all, you can use your IRA or 401k funds to make your purchase. Bulk Food International. 816-888-8290. Investing in your future. Typical estate planning is transactional, focused solely on money, offering cookie-cutter documents, resulting in plans that do not address what is truly important to you and your loved ones. Bridge Builder's unique planning process focuses on the three dimensions of family wealth. Financial, what you own. Human, who you are. And intellectual, what you know. Bridge Builder, plans for life, architects at protecting and perpetuating family wealth for generations. Please contact Bridge Builder for a free consultation at 913-956-3984. Looking to ship freight but not sure how? Choose AOK Freight to be your single source for all your shipping needs and we'll take care of all the work for you. We offer the balance of budget-friendly prices, seasoned account managers, and trusted trucking options with leading technology. With more than 20 years of experience in the freight shipping industry and having moved over $1 billion in freight, we know the importance of providing competitive rates and dependable services for truckload, LTL, and intermodal freight services for all industries. If you are a company looking to save on your shipping expense without giving up dependability, let us be your personal shipping assistant. Call us now at 816-301-6226 or find us on the web at www.aokfreight.com. There's a revolution occurring in the investment world. Exchange-traded funds, which have been called the next generation mutual funds, can help lower your investment costs, reduce your tax bill, and increase your investment options. This is Nate Geraci with the ETF Store, an investment advisor located right here in Kansas City. Call us toll-free at 877-365-3837 or visit us online at etfstore.com. And don't forget to tune in to the ETF Store Show every Tuesday at 9 a.m. right here on ESPN 1510. It's a fact that most any day can be a special day for someone. A birthday, an engagement, an anniversary, a promotion, or an I love you day. It's also a fact that Lichtenberg's Fine Jewelry offers hundreds of ways to say love or thanks or congrats or I'm so happy you're in my life. So when you want to make your special day extra special, think Lichtenberg's Fine Jewelry, 131st and State Line, 816-941-2221. Tired of running around town trying to find the best products for your business? Regal Distributing can help. With over 9,000 stock products in categories like food service packaging, professional facilities, office supplies, and sustainable janitorial solutions, you'll be sure to find what you need at Regal. Visit us on the web at GetRegal.com or call locally at 913-894-8787. And don't forget to check out Regal's state-of-the-art showroom and training center located off 435 and K-10 Highway. Go with the local partner you can trust. 
Go with Regal. Distributing service and solutions since 1955. Welcome back to the ETF Store Show. Nate and Connor in studio this morning. Now it's time for our weekly market update. And now it's time for this week's market update. Tune in every week as the ETF Store brings you the information you need to know on the financial markets. Well, this is turning into somewhat of a broken record, but it was again another record-setting week for stocks last week. The Spider S&P 500 ETF was up close to a half of a percent. And it's now up some 10% since bottoming in mid-October. The Vanguard Developed Markets ETF was up about three-quarters of a percent. And the Schwab Emerging Markets Equity ETF was up nearly two-thirds of a percent for the week. Bonds were down just a bit last week. The iShare 7- to 10-year Treasury Bond ETF was down about a tenth of a percent. And finally, looking at some alternative investments, the iShares Gold Trust was up close to 1.5%. The Rogers International Commodity ETN was down over 1%, and the Vanguard REIT ETF was down about two-thirds of a percent for the week. And there really weren't any major news items last week. I guess the one thing that seems to be making the most headlines right now is the price of oil. So I thought we might spend a few minutes on that this morning. The price of crude oil is down about 30% since June. And as a matter of fact, it's at its lowest level in over four years. And the market is watching this very closely, trying to figure out whether this is good or bad. Because on one hand, certainly lower oil prices can benefit consumers with lower gas prices and heating bills. But Connor, on the other hand, you have to ask the question of whether the price of oil reflects poorly on the overall health of the global economy. Yeah, the the impact on the price of oil is beyond just what's happening here in the U.S., as our oil consumption has peaked several years ago. And, and the concern that a lot of investors are raising is, is, the pri- is the dropping price of oil the canary in the coal mine when considering the health of the global economy? That, that's the real concern a lot of investors have with the price of oil. But then on the other hand, lower oil costs can certainly boost consumer spending. And everybody's seeing that with average gas prices across the country below $3 a gallon for the first time in several years. That can be an an added tailwind to our economy and not bad timing with the holiday shopping season uh, upon us. Well, you know, the New York Times had some great data points on this last week. Uh, I came across an article titled, Lower oil prices give a lift to the American economy, and they noted that Americans spend roughly $1 billion a day on gasoline, and that consumers will save approximately $8.5 billion in November and December compared with the last two months of 2013. Obviously, those numbers are nothing to sneeze at, and they also noted that the typical American household buys 1,200 gallons of gasoline annually. So any drop in prices can have a real impact, and that's not even accounting for homes that might use home heating oil and what could be saved from the price declines there. Yeah, Nate, it, it's not insubstantial. And look, we, we've talked about this recovery and why it's been maybe the least appreciated bull market um, in history. And one of the main reasons is this, the, the middle and lower class have largely been left behind by this massive recovery, at least in the stock market. Low wage growth has been and continues to be a real problem for our economy. And with the middle and lower class, a larger portion of their income is used towards fixed costs, such as, you know, heating your home, filling your your car with gas and food. So a reduction in costs, like we just mentioned with gas prices being so much lower, can be a huge boon for the economy because those dollars most often directly translate into money being spent elsewhere in the economy. Now, the other side of this is we do need to pay attention to what the price of oil may be telling us about the health of the global economy, whether there is, uh, in fact, lower demand for oil because of slowing economic growth. And we actually talked about this in some detail with Matt Smith. He's a global commodity analyst with Schneider Energy. He was on the show about a month and a half ago, and there are a lot of moving parts here. But the way he put it was that it's really been the stronger U.S. dollar that's having the biggest impact on the price of oil. Now, certainly the stronger dollar is a reflection of the health of the U.S. economy, 
relative to other parts of the world. So I think uh, it's this combination of the strength of the U.S. economy and the dollar and then weakness elsewhere. But take a listen to some of Matt's comments on this. Like the equity markets, which is, an, as you know, are an exchange market. You buy a share of Apple and, and you're going to pay a fair price for that, that share of Apple, give or take a few pennies. The bond market is an over-the-counter market, which means that every dealer is free. Well, I think we have the wrong clip there. But look, here's, here's the bottom line. There's certainly some relationship in terms of the price of oil and the health of the global economy. And, you know, I think it's this combination of the stronger U.S. economy relative to other parts of the world. That's resulting in a stronger U.S. dollar. And then you add to that lower demand from some of the other countries. And, Connor, you know, I also don't think you can discount U.S. oil production, which continues to ramp up. Yeah, the the oil boom in the U.S. continues to be a big story, and it's certainly influencing the supply and demand characteristics of the oil market. There are a lot of interesting dynamics going on, Nate, with, with some thinking Saudi Arabia is intentionally keeping production up to keep prices low because Saudi Arabia can be profitable in their oil production at a much lower price point than a lot of these new um, newly online oil production facilities in the U.S. So a lot of people are thinking that Saudi Arabia is intentionally keeping prices low to try to, you know, essentially price out or get some of at least the expansion in the U.S. oil boom t- to at least stop for the time being. So there's a lot of geopolitical dynamics behind um, the price of oil always. But, you know, I think that the clip that we were going to play from Matt Smith was also going to focus on the stronger U.S. dollar. And we talked about this over the last couple of weeks, that the stronger dollar is negatively impacting all commodity prices, and, and, and especially gold, which is the most obvious. And oil is another um, significant commodity that it's there's some negative pressure on the price of it because the u.s dollar stronger versus other global currencies primarily the yen and the euro well in any event i think this is going to be something to to really watch going out here over the next year or so you know how much does the price of oil declining help consumers uh and then you know again what does this say about the global economy so we'll continue to keep our eye on that we are bumping up against uh, the clock here. I think our interview earlier ran long, but I do want to try to squeeze in the ETF Spotlight. It's time for the ETF Spotlight, where each week the ETF store highlights one exchange-traded fund. There are over 1,600 ETFs available to invest in. The ETF store sorts through them all so you don't have to. If you joined us earlier, we talked about a high-income ETF, the Yield Shares High Income ETF. And we also talked about a new cybersecurity ETF. Obviously, that's in the tech space. So I thought perhaps we would spotlight an ETF that sort of combines both of these themes, income and technology. And so the ETF we're spotlighting this week is the First Trust NASDAQ Technology Dividend ETF. The ticker on that is TDIV. This ETF focuses on dividend-paying technology companies, uh, which is a little bit of an oxymoron in that Many technology companies don't pay dividends, or they pay fairly small dividends. But this ETF holds nearly 100 companies classified as technology or telecommunications companies. They have a minimum market value of $500 million, and they paid a regular or common dividend within the past 12 months. Their dividend yield must be at least 0.5%, and they also cannot have decreased dividends per share within the last 12 months. Top holdings include big names like Apple, Microsoft, Cisco, Intel, and IBM, those five alone account for about 40% of this ETF's assets. Altogether, this ETF holds 80% tech companies, 20% telecom companies, and the holdings within each of these two buckets are weighted by dividends paid over the past 12 months. I should also note that there's a little bit of international exposure here. About 14% of the holdings are companies based outside the U.S. The dividend yield for this ETF is currently 2.6%. Uh, You can compare that to something like the Spider Technology ETF, which has a dividend yield about a full percentage point lower. The expense ratio for TDIV is 0.5%, and year-to-date it's up close to 15%. So, Connor, a a dividend-focused tech fund. Yeah, Nate. What what, Part of the evolution in the ETF space is we're seeing dividend-focused funds almost in any asset class. There's emerging market funds with dividends, international funds, small cap. And this is just another example where I view it as as almost a blue chip tech fund. You know, if you're getting exposure, you know, essentially to the NASDAQ, but with the focus on dividends, that, you know, the names you mentioned as the top five holdings, I mean, it results in 
in essentially owning more established blue chip type companies, which for maybe a more conservative investor or income focused investor can still be a nice way to get some exposure to the upside of technology and the NASDAQ in general. Well, and obviously you think about things like the growth in mobile computing uh, with phones and tablets and cloud computing. This really is a fascinating space. And you look going forward, again, if you wanted to uh, make some sort of overweight to the tech sector and also have some income, uh, boy, this could be an interesting ETF to take a look at. Yeah, it is. It's another great example of the you know, evolution and and unique, very specific exposure through ETFs where as a more conservative investor, you can have almost the exact same asset class exposure to small cap and emerging markets and international and and tech, but have a dividend blue chip type weighting towards all those exposures, which can be really attractive. That ETF is the First Trust NASDAQ Technology Dividend ETF, ticker TDIV. That is all the time we have for today's show. I want to thank Christian Magoon for joining us this morning. And as a reminder, you can listen to our interview with Christian or any of our podcasts by visiting ETFstore.com. The show is also available for free through Apple iTunes, Stitcher Radio, and now TuneIn Radio. Check us out on social media. We're on Twitter, Facebook, and LinkedIn. You can stay up to date on all the latest from both the ETF Store and the ETF Store show. Thanks again for joining us this morning, and be sure to tune in next Tuesday at 9 a.m. We've got a great guest for you. Wesley Gray, a Ph.D. and executive managing member at Alpha Architect, will join us to spotlight the Value Shares U.S. Quantitative Value ETF. Until then, have a great week, everyone. 